All right, let's get started. So um, welcome everyone. We're going through, through um, how to avoid biases in your product experiments today. Uh, this was a result of the last webinar and a lot of the questions I got and the Twitter polling that I ran where people were really interested in kind of how to avoid biases in product experimentation. So we're gonna cover our top, uh, top three today. And um, just a little bit about myself and again, David Bland, um, advisor out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I really focus on product experimentation. So that's pretty much what I do. And uh, so some house cleaning here, basically is this is gonna be recorded. So if you have to bail or you have a friend that wasn't able to make it and they wanna watch it, it's going to be recorded and posted on the Prefoil blog. And then I'll also have any additional Q and A that I can't get to in, in this webinar. So I usually try to save time at the end for everyone. But if I can't get to it, you know, I'll take some time and put some thought into your questions and try to write them up and post them on the blog as well. All right, so let's get started. So I'm curious, um, just by showing uh, hands using the you know, raise hands in the, in the webinar feature there, uh, how many of you want to run experiments without biasing the results? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see a lot of raised hands. Yeah, this is the one thing that came out of the last webinar. Everyone was so concerned about that. And I tried to focus on brand in the last webinar and so many things around just, I don't know the process, I don't know how to, to do this without bias and everything. And, and biases aren't necessarily inherently bad. Uh, they, they've helped us kind of survive, you know, for, for all this time. But there are kind of three common biases that I seem to see time and time again that kind of bite us when we're trying to do product experimentation. And so those are the ones I'm gonna to cover today. There are more than three, by the way, but in reality, you know, almost 80, 90% of the time, these are the three that come up and in the teams and in their experiment design, when they're interpreting the results, and just how they're trying to apply scientific method to building a new product uh, or, or feature or service business. So let's start number one, confirmation bias. This is probably the most popular one, I would say. Um, it's something that kind of creeps in time and time again when we're um, building, you know, trying to build experimentation into how we work. And if you look at kind of the definition of, uh, of this, it's basically you know, the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories. And again, this is kind of pulling off what's kept us alive for all this time, but it doesn't, you know, what's, what's keeping us alive doesn't always uh, work out really well when we're trying to test out a new idea or a new product or a new business. You know, we tend to kind of confirm things that, you know, based on our kind of moral structure and what we already believe. And so, Really, the risk here is that you prematurely validate a hypothesis. And so I think that is something that we're all really sensitive to if we really believe in working this way. It's, oh, I accidentally you know, scaled something that nobody cared about. And I thought I was following the process. And you know, it looked like I was following all the steps. But then the thing was still a big flop in a big way when we tried, when we tried to go you know, and scale it and everything. So, you know, really what I see this occurring with teams, and these are teams that I'm working with, you know, in startups, but also in big corporations and government, it's, it's really when you set that bar too low and then you end up proving yourself right. So think about, you know, the last time you did a set of interviews, right? So when you're doing a set of interviews, I recommend, you know, probably around 15 to 20 interviews, you know, of a customer segment. And so if you say, I'm gonna interview 15 to 20 people about a specific thing, and I know I'm right if, you know, five of them want this, <laughs> you know, if you're doing B2B, that might work, you know, maybe five is great, you know, if you can narrow in on five giant integrations or uh, deals, and, and five is, is amazing if you're B2B, but usually when I'm working with B2C, it's, it's almost like, well, if anybody wants this, it's good. <laughs> you know, if anybody out of the 20, we just, we set the bar so low um, that we kind of go ahead and move ahead. And I think it's, it's not inherently uh, bad. It's usually because we're excited about the idea. It's usually uh, because, you know, we really want to build the thing anyway, because inherently we're creative people and we want to create and we want to build new things and put them out in the world for people to see. And um, so I think there's, you know, it's not necessarily nefarious, you know, as far as uh, the, the, the meaning behind it, but the idea of, you know, we set that bar too low, you can accidentally go forward with something that maybe you kind of should have uh, spent some more time on in the validation phase and discovery phase. So uh, another thing would be something like a landing page, right? So if you have a landing page 
and you're driving traffic to it and you're driving a very narrow um, segment to that very specific value proposition. Th this is different, by the way, if you're you know, doing marketing for a giant product that's been out in the, the world forever and you're just kind of putting it out to everybody and seeing what the conversion rates, those conversion rates are gonna be always low because you're just, there's a big wide net and there's so many different uh, personas and, and targets there that are coming in that you know, not everybody's gonna, gonna convert. But if you narrow in and say, okay, for this specific value prop, you know, like these jobs, pains, and gains, if I, if I pull from my friend Alex Ostwalder there, if you're able to dial in on those and then you find those people online and offline and, and you pull them into your, to your, uh, to your landing page, and you even have something like a, an email capture for them to, uh, to sign up. That should be around 15% conversion you're looking for there. And when I say that, people usually have one or two reactions. One, they kind of nod and they go, yeah, it sounds about right. And, and the other is they, they panic and they get very defensive that they'll never be able to hit 15%. And, and that's usually because they start to understand the ramifications of it, right? You're setting the bar kind of high um, to get a 15% kind of sign up rate for a thing that's very specific for targeting a very specific customer that you're showing the page to. Okay. That 15% drops to like a 1% or below 1% if you're targeting everybody. But if you're targeting a really specific segment, 15% should be about what you're looking for. Cause you want a strong signal that you're on the right track here. Um, and you're probably not going to get it right away. You'll probably have to iterate on it over time, iterate on your ads, iterate on your page. There's a bunch of back and forth there to figure it out. But I've seen teams go from one to 2% to greater than 15%. I had one team that went to 40% there. And so it's doable, but you have to spend time using the words of the customer and everything. But I think if we set the bar really low, then we kind of launch a landing page and then we you know, prematurely validate it. So another kind of real world example I'll talk about a little bit here, and again, just from the outside. But think of Quickster. Remember Quickster with, uh, with Netflix? Yeah, no, probably, unless you were around for the actual uh, launch, like kind of publicity PR push there, you probably don't remember because <laughs> it went away pretty quickly. But imagine like setting the bar really low on something like this, which is inherently can, can, can decouple and break up a company, right? Because you're saying, hey, DVDs are going to be this thing. And imagine if you only talk to a few people and go, hey, that seems like a pretty good idea. Let's go forward. And you don't spend enough time. Um, and if you look at all the interviews around this uh, and all the, all, the, all the blog posts that have been written about this, you'll notice that like against our best judgment, against like spending time on it, we just pushed ahead. And it was to like really bad ramifications. I mean, if you looked at their stock and how it just fell off a cliff, like it, it was, it was, they were not, Netflix was not headed in a great you know, direction. And which is crazy because uh, Netflix is really good at experimentation. I would put them in maybe top five, maybe top 10 of companies that I've seen that really get it, you know, and even companies like that can fall into this trap where we, we set the bar really low and we say, okay, let's just go forward because we really want to do this anyway. And, and then suffer kind of the backlash from, you know, from the market. And so there are some things you can do. Um, uh, usually the tips I give to teams to kind of be mindful of this is one, just know it exists and know that confirmation bias exists. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it can really bias your experimentation. And, you know, try to set the success bar high. And like I said, if you're going, you know, let's say you interview 10 people, like look for eight out of 10, right? If you're doing a landing page and you're looking for a conversion rate on an email sign up, look for that to be, you know, 15%. So 15 out of every hundred. Um, if you're um, doing more open-ended discovery work and you're trying to find, hey, we rank the jobs, pains, and gains in our value prop canvas to our customer profile. And we want an 80% accuracy rate when we go to those segments and we have them blind rank. Okay, not, not, now 80% is really high. But, but think about what happens if you're wrong there. So for example, if you've ranked all the top jobs, pains, and gains, and you think you're really dialed in, and you go out and find that you're wrong, and you just keep going, and imagine you know, it's gonna be really expensive to course correct later on if you target all your marketing around that value prop and those jobs. If you target your product or, or um, service design to go after those jobs and people don't care about it. You know, so often I, we do this uh, discovery work and we find out that the top jobs we thought they cared about aren't actually the jobs that they care about as much. I mean, there's other jobs that are kind of higher value. 
or the pains, you know? Yeah, those things are annoying, but they're not a pain. It's more of a nuisance. Like if you could solve this other pain for me, I would throw money at you. So that's another thing to think about with regards to, you know, if you're wrong, you know, it does have big ramifications uh, with, with regards to your strategy. And then the other thing I recommend is create competing hypotheses to challenge your biases. So, you know, try to do both. Try to do the positive and the negative. Like we believe that um, people will do blah, blah, blah. Or we believe that people won't do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know? And I don't see enough teams doing this. And again, I think it comes back into the biases and how we work. But I don't see a lot of teams like really creating competing hypotheses that, that, that would say, this is, you know, we believe this is true and we believe this isn't true. And, and just really trying to find creative ways to test both. And maybe because it's, uh, and I'd love to hear you all, your questions around that. Like, what are your concerns from doing that? Is it just not enough time? Is it we don't have enough people? Uh, is it that we're afraid to maybe disprove what we want to build? I'd really love to know what you hear. Um, just, just basically hit me up with the questions here. But I'd really love to know what is holding you back from doing this? Because it's not that hard, you know, let's say you have a canvas and you've uh, filled out your assumptions map and you're kind of creating these like well-formed hypotheses, you know, you're shaping them into these things that you want to run experiments on. And that's the flow that almost always, always works. And what's stopping you from saying, okay, well, let's do the antithesis here. Like let's actually create one that would disprove it. What is stopping us? So but that's another thing that can help you, right? So to challenge your beliefs, you know, and not set the bar too low and basically prematurely validate and move on, you know, set the bar high and then create competing hypotheses and, and spend the time, you know, validating those as well or invalidating those. Okay. The next one I want to talk about here is overconfidence bias. And this is probably uh, the second most frequent one I see. Uh, I think confirmation bias is by far and away number one, but this one is pretty strong number two. You know, it's, it's again, it's not as common as, as confirmation, but it's there for sure. And um, the definition here is a self-perception that one's judgment is reliably greater than objective accuracy. So um, the risk here is basically, you know, you have uh, an excessive confidence in your own answers to questions. <laughs> so, and this is different from confirmation bias because confirmation bias, you're sort of setting the bar really low and then you're saying, yep, that looks good. But this is more like, I'm so right in this situation. Like, yeah, we, we can experiment, but I am so right here. I don't even know if we need to experiment. And, and so they're somewhat related there, but this one I think is different enough to call it out differently in the sense of you just have this confidence. Like you're working with this very passionate founder who is very much like, I have this vision of where the world should be, you know? And uh, it's almost uh, kind of like cult-like sometimes with some of, some of these leaders. And so you want to believe them, but then it's like, well, do they really know? <laughs> um, I think Steve Blank has a great quote there. Is like, is it reality or is it like a hallucination? <laughs> and sometimes it's a hallucination because we don't really have, we just have this excessive confidence. And uh, it's amazing to me how this plays out in organizations and, and in their experimentation. And so um, it usually uh, it usually happens um, when you're when you're again when you're focusing on this ability to know the answer. Like no matter what the question, no matter you know, yeah, we have these hypotheses, but do we really need to test those? I think I know all the answers. And this kind of taps into what it what it means to be a leader today and how we've grown up being leaders and there's a lot of material around this and i've i've certainly observed this in organizations where like your journey to becoming a leader is you were probably really good at something you know somewhere in your company and then people started coming to you for help okay it's like you're a subject matter expert you know this really well and i'm going to come to you because you know the answers so it's very egocentric in the way you become a leader and then you might you know be uh, in charge of some teams right? And you kind of go up the ladder a little bit and it's like, okay, still these leads are coming to me because they're not sure how to solve something and I'm going to tell them how to solve it. And before you know it, you kind of worked your way up in the org and you might even be at the C level where it's still that framing of leadership where I'm confident in my ability to know the answers because I was an expert and that's how I got recognition. And so at some point in your organization, and if you're going to build an experimentation culture and you want to run product experiments, you really need to figure out at this moment, it's almost like having an epiphany of 
oh, my job isn't to have the answers all the time, it's to create great leaders around me. And how do I do that? Because they can't always come to me for the answer, especially if I'm trying to incorporate this idea of we're gonna go experiment and learn. Because if you, if you say, okay, I'm right, and then they experiment and find that you're wrong, then it kind of, it really shakes the base of what you feel uh, makes up, like your moral kind of fiber of what makes up you being a leader. And that's very frightening for a lot of people, especially if you've built your whole career on having that confidence. So you have to be very careful about that. And so in, you know, when I do leadership training and stuff like that, I really try to kind of build this awareness of, look, if you don't know the answer, just don't pretend you know the answer, you know, try to create an environment where people can find the answer and empower them in a real way and lead with questions. And so there's a lot you can do there. Um, one of the great examples, I know you've all seen this one, but I'm, I'm going to bring it up again, is, is the Fire Phone. So let's talk about the Fire Phone for a minute. Amazon is amazing at experimentation. I mean, they have like the amount of quant data they have and how they test and how they do it. It's in pretty incredible to watch what they do. Okay. But imagine, let's say you're, you know, Bezos and you say, I know everyone wants a fire phone. Yeah, we could go test that, but I know they want a fire phone. So you know what, all those processes and all that great stuff that we use to, let's say, build, you know, multi-billion dollar company, let's just throw that aside and we're going to build this thing and it's going to be amazing. And it completely flopped. And, you know, if you look at kind of the post-mortem of that phone, you'll notice that they didn't work kind of the Amazon way, it didn't really apply here. And which was really surprising to me because I feel like it's so ingrained in their culture. And if you think about, um, you know, Bezos, he often says like, you have to scale the size of your failures as you scale the size of your company. And I get that. And I'm just wondering if he's thinking about this when he says that, because certainly that was a big scaled failure. But the caveat here is it was very much an overconfidence bias that of course people are going to want this. And of course we should build it. And you know, yeah, we could experiment, but we don't really need to. And it, and it blew up in a big way. So even companies like Netflix, like Amazon, who really get experimentation can fall into that bias trap. They can fall into that trap where you're so confident that you feel like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't really apply here. We'll just go build this thing and we're, and we're gonna be okay. So when I'm thinking about tips, like what tips do I give teams when they're kind of stuck in this overconfidence bias or I observe it when I'm working with them? And there are a couple of different ways I try to approach it. One is, um, I really encourage open-ended discovery testing to explore more than one answer. So just like imagine earlier on in that phone, we're like, yep, it's a phone. And he's like, well, it could be a phone. Uh, it could be other things. Like, why don't we spend some more time really deeply understanding the job to be done for that phone or the pains people have with existing smartphones? Because there are, you know, I love my iPhone. I've had it forever, but you know, there are challenges and pains I have with it. So, you know, what is it that we could anchor on there and just spend some more time there instead of rushing to build, you know? So I often try to, you know, it's almost like you have to slow down to speed up. So you need to slow down to basically perform more open-ended kind of discovery. Um, think of design thinking, it's very similar, kind of go wide and then decide or uh, generation and synthesis, kind of that double diamond approach. Don't be afraid to go wide early on and test some different options. You know, it may not be a phone that solves a problem you're trying to solve for there. And then try to test multiple ideas at the same time uh, and then find what combination is the best. Quite often when I'm working with teams that experiment, they'll try different you know, kind of things and the result will be almost like a combination thereof. And they'll learn from each other. And it's pretty amazing to watch because it doesn't mean you Frankenstein it kind of all together, but it means, wow, they were onto something that we didn't even think about. How could we incorporate that into our offering? And so quite often, um, I'll do this in different exercises like, uh, oh, like design strats. So I learned that from Jeff Gothelf and Josh Seiden, who wrote Lean UX, I used to work with. And uh, when I do design strats, I have a very particular way I do it though. It's a little different than what they do. And what happens is when people go around the room, they have to showcase and share out, okay, here's the problem I'm trying to solve with this. Here's the solution and here's the reward that the customer is looking for. And I would say almost like nine times out of 10, when I have the whole team share out, and they have to create one more, they go, wow, you know what? I really like this part of yours and this part of mine and this part of this one over here. What would we do if we try to incorporate all that together? And it's amazing. And it's something they never would have thought up in isolation, but they kind of needed the space in isolation to come up with their, with their idea to then share out and then 
get feedback. So there are ways you can facilitate this that will work for your teams. They'll 100% work for your teams. But you kind of have to set the context of, all right, we need to create space for this because if we just narrow in on one idea really early and then try to scale it, it looks amazing when you get it right, but if you get it wrong, you know, basically you might not be able to recover from it at all. So again, overconfidence bias, try to do more open-ended discovery testing, and then also be open to testing multiple ideas and then combining bits of the ideas together into something that might work versus just going, going with one idea um, by itself. So experimenters bias. Let's talk about experimenters bias really quickly too. Okay, so um, this one's really interesting. I would say it's, again, in the top three, it's probably a little more distant. Um, but the idea of, um, this is the process where scientists perform the research that influences the results of portray a certain outcome. So the risk here is you're only believing data that agrees with your hypothesis. So again, a little different than the first two, right? So the first one was, okay, we're just, confirming things and we're going to set the bar so low and we're going to move on. Okay. So the bar is super low. The second one is about, I'm so confident that I don't believe we even need to experiment. <laughs> okay. This one's different with, uh, so with the experimenter in that you're kind of going into this idea of, okay, yeah, I believe in experimentation. Cool. I'll do that. However, you know, the way you perform the research, it still influences the outcome. <laughs> so, so this usually occurs when you kind of discard data that conflicts with their hypotheses. So it results in manipulating the results to give you the illusion of being correct in your prediction. So it, it's pretty interesting. I feel like there's like almost like a stages of grief here or something where it's first like, well, I don't want to experiment. Okay, I'll experiment. But then I'm going to maybe unintentionally manipulate the results so that I can do whatever I want anyway. So again, I think this is all what makes it hard, um, but there are ways you can you kind of be mindful of this. Like when you're running experiments with your teams, you know, are we discarding some of this stuff that's giving us negative feedback that we're not on the right track? You know, um, it, it's it's not uh, it's like you're not attacking the data. You're not saying, uh, "Oh, that's not our customer." When it, when it clearly met the profile of your customer, and they gave you a bunch of negative feedback that you do try to explain it away. And, and so the one I want to talk about here a little bit, and again, I think Starbucks is amazing in experimentation. I really do. But, but this, this unicorn frap that they created, um, it was pretty interesting because it tested really well with regards to the look. So it's very Instagrammable, okay? So who doesn't want to see an Instagram filled with these things? It's beautiful. It just like lights up your screen. But it didn't taste very good. <laughs> and so, so imagine like you're kind of experimenting your way through this and you say, okay, well, this looks amazing and it's going to go viral, but people don't like the way it tastes. <laughs> so that's going to cause some problems. And imagine just explaining that away. You go, no, no, it's, it's fine. They'll get used to it. Their, their, their palate will acclimate to the amazingness that is the unicorn frap. Uh, and it never happened, right? And, and so it was kind of a failure. But it could have been probably uh, pre prevented even like, again, Starbucks is really great experimentation. They do all kinds of stuff. Like when I walk into a Starbucks, uh, I'll see these little, you know, like circles down going, hey, wouldn't you like to charge your portable device here? And it's just, a, it's just like a little coaster. And you know, they're testing out placement of, oh, okay. If I actually put a portable charger in the tables here at Starbucks, like this is the location we should have it at. This is where people really want it. This is where they work. And this is where they want to put their phone down for wireless charging. And so they do a lot of amazing stuff. Um, but this, it's a good example of somebody that's really great at experimentation. This looks at, through a very narrow lens of, well, we want to launch this anyway, and it looks great, and that's what counts. When in reality, you should spend more time interpreting the feedback of, um, hey, people don't like the taste. you know. Um, so, and then, I, so how I address this with teams. So again, I think with this, one way to combat this is involving others in the data synthesis process to bring in different perspectives. So if you have a diverse team and you're synthesizing feedback from, let's say, interviews, I'm a big believer of having that as a team project. So get the team together, look through the quotes, put those on stickies, put them on the wall, start clustering them and affinity sorting them and find out what themes are emerging from these results. And that is much better than one person taking all the Google Docs and all the, all the quotes and everything that you've done to capture those interviews and going off in a corner and kind of going through it alone and then presenting it out to the team. 
it's not that they're, again, it's not they're doing anything wrong. It's not that they have bad intentions in doing that, but your biases creep in, right? And so what's the harm of saying, oh, that one person said, you know, they didn't like the taste. Well, let's just not put that one in the results. Let's not put that one in the share out. It's, it's really easy to do by yourself. It's harder to do with a diverse team together, I find. So when you are going through and interpreting results, basically what I want you to do is think about, okay, how do we invite the whole team in? What if we just wrote down, you know, these quotes and put them up on the wall and kind of just sort them and see what themes emerge. You're going to take so much of the bias out of the process just by looking. And you see a giant cluster of like red feedback on, you know, people don't feel like this solves a meaningful problem. They don't want this, you know, talk about it. Don't just discard it. Okay. And then also what you can do is you can run multiple experiments to generate evidence for, for your hypothesis. So um, this is another thing I find teams um, maybe trip up on where they do one hypothesis to one experiment. And so it's not a, always a one to one, uh, quite often it's a one to many. And I think this is where maybe we could do a better job as a community of explaining that, where if you have a hypothesis that's really important and you have no evidence to support it, don't be afraid to run multiple things on that or run multiple experiments on that hypothesis. Um, you may even spend, you know, six, 12 weeks on that hypothesis, just running different types of experiments on it. And that's okay because often you, maybe you do interviews and people say, well, I don't want that. And it, and you feel really demoralized and you don't want to go forward, but then you do something else like an ad to a landing page. It goes really well, or you paper prototype with somebody and they get really excited by it. So don't be afraid to try multiple things um, because it will help you generate an overall sense of evidence that will help you kind of remove some of these biases where you're just explaining away. And sometimes, you know, it can just help you overall build up your case for, should we invest in this based on the evidence that, um, that we, that we created. Okay. So, um, I'm going to look at questions. Also, the book is out November 12th. It's very exciting. Uh, it's going to be in stock in the publisher at October 28th, even, which is I'm even more excited about, but yeah, it's already kind of shot to number one in economics and on business entrepreneurship, just based on pre-orders loan on Amazon. So, uh, I have no idea how Amazon does all that, but it's pretty amazing to see. So by all means, uh, a lot of this stuff that I'm covering high level here in the webinar, you get a much deeper dive into it in the book. Uh, we have 44 experiments in there and uh, we have stuff around biases in there as well and around leadership and around team design and ceremonies. Um, so I'm going to pause here and look at questions and I'll try to answer these and be mindful of your all time because we have about three minutes left. So, um, so I'm very interested to see how experiments sort of line up with the product life cycle into growth, mature, and decline. Would love to hear your perspective on that and what sort of experiment to conduct at what stage. That, that's a cool question. So usually I like anchoring against uh, pirate metrics if I can on some of this stuff. So acquisition, activation, retention, referral, revenue. And uh, there is, it's not perfect, but if you anchor in on that, there's a lot of stuff where you can see, oh, you know what? We're uh, just starting out. We need to just see if anybody has this problem and can we get them in to kind of create a profile or download our app or do something meaningful. And so when I do that, it's usually around acquisition and activation. And it's really around kind of um, awareness. You know, are they aware that your thing exists and do they, do they respond uh, well to that awareness? And are they hopeful it solves a real problem? So it's a lot of value prop testing, a lot of discovery work. And, um, but as you move through that and you kind of build something, like you have an MVP or you're building a product, right? You want to kind of move more into activation retention. You know, you want to be able to say, hey, will they use this thing and will they use it multiple times? Because sometimes your value prop's amazing, but the product doesn't capture the essence of it and you just churn out all your customers. So a lot of, um, you know, right before you grow, a lot of the experimentation I find on teams is around, can we experiment on do people use this and do they come back and use it more than once? And then when you're in growth, that's when you're more trying to figure out revenue. Uh, not that you don't figure it out early on as far as business modeling, but how to scale it, you know, and then looking at referrals um, as a referral strategy. What's your kind of engine of growth, as Eric Reese would say. So he kind of frames this engine of value and engine of growth. So if you want to use Eric's framing, I use value more of, if you're building this value-based product, that's more about, are people coming in, using it, and coming back? And when you're looking at growth, it's like, how do you scale the business model and how do you scale the product? And then on the winding down, yeah, that's that's tough. Um, I don't really have experiments to anchor against there that come off the top of my head, but I would say 
the teams I work with that are sunsetting a product, they are typically running experiments to see, can we get them to convert into whatever the new thing it is we're building? Unless we're just shutting down the product, the company entirely. So um, I, have, I have spoken with some teams recently that were trying to do that. And basically what they try to do is, hey, we have some amazing customers. This is going away. Can we experiment in a way where we get them into another, um, into another product? And, and, that, and that's really uh, a lot of the experiments we have in the book can, can address some of that. So again, it's, you can do some MVP testing with them. You can uh, do some value prop testing with them. You can see what are the gaps between what you're winding down and what you offer next. There are all kinds of really cool things you could do there. Okay, and I'll try to answer one more. So, um, all right, so um, in a recent experiment with my team, I was going through, one of the stakeholders made a comment that you guys designed the hypothesis and are seeking feedback. Therefore, the evidence looks positive, uh, even though the feedback was true without leading user group and expected results. How to go about this situation, especially when teams have a limited time? Oh, so this is kind of like, the, so the stakeholders giving feedback on, well, you guys designed the experiment, therefore, of course, it looks good. Yeah, and again, I think this is where designing um, competing uh, hypotheses could benefit you, where you say, hey, we designed this and we ran the test and then we designed this other one that was trying to disprove it and this is what it looked like too. So you have both sides. Um, but I agree, if you don't have a lot of time, it's just tough to, to do that. So I think it really comes back to your team um, people always ask me like, how much time should a team be <laughs> dedicated? And I always say hundred <laughs> percent. And they usually either say, okay, or they just freak out. Uh, but if you have a team that's hundred percent, you know, you, you should really try to find a way to basically get them in a situation where they can test the, the kind of the pros and cons or the positive and negatives of things. So um, I think that could help, but again, you probably need to pull your stakeholder side too and just educate the stakeholder a little bit on this is how we're working. This is how we're doing this. It's not just us proving out what we want to build. So there is some probably soft, I don't want to say soft skills, but there's certainly some one-on-one -on -one time maybe that you can do as well and just educating the process um, just to make it sure. Because I mean, let's face it, a lot of people just go and build what they want anyway. Um, and they just use whatever process that gets in their way that helps them, you know, <laughs> or helps them to jump the next phase gate to get to building whatever the thing is. So there is some merit to that. But I think if you're, you've taken the time to explain how you're doing it and that something that you feedback you get isn't um, positive, then that can help as well. So again, this will be uh, recorded and I'll have it up on the Precoil blog. And I wanna thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your week.